Welcome to First. I'm Shirley Min along with Nichelle Polston and Mark Eichmann. Heroin has been a public health menace for decades, but the problem is growing even more widespread as the drug takes hold of more Delawareans from all walks of life. Teaching kids about money is important. This week, we show you a money lesson that comes right from the Federal Reserve Bank. And get ready as the Cape May Lewis Ferry celebrates 50 years. We have a sneak peek of our program, Billion Mile Journey. First, your public media news magazine starts now. addiction was once a poor inner city problem until now. A nationwide study found the majority of heroin users are suburban white men and women with the average age of 23. Delaware health officials say prescription painkillers are to blame. This is the state grapples with its eighth overdose death linked to heroin laced with a synthetic painkiller fentanyl. In this week's first look we explore Delaware's heroin epidemic and what more needs to be done. Tyler Keister came from a good family. He was funny, smart, athletic, and addicted to heroin. He overdosed and died two days before Christmas 2012. You're never over something like this. Uh, certain things seem to stimulate emotions, and it can be any number of things that, that may do that. A song is something you see, something you've done with your son. Unfortunately, Tyler's story is not unique. Thousands of families in Delaware are affected by heroin addiction. With the heroin, it just, in my mind, as well as my body, it just couldn't be without it. Stephanie King used heroin after initially getting hooked on Percocet. Stealing or um, breaking into someone's home, in my right state of mind and how I grew up, I know that's wrong. But if I have heroin in my system, nothing's going to stop me. Mom Becky King didn't know what to do or where to go for help. I just thought we were going to bury her. I, I really did. But in spite of relapses, even attempts on her own life, Stephanie is now 20 months sober. And we don't know why she's here, but I'm so glad, I'm so grateful. I said, as long as I have breath, I'll fight this. Delaware Health and Social Services has tracked how many adults have sought help from state-funded addiction treatment centers, dating back to 1987. In the 80s, Delaware treated almost 400 people for a heroin addiction. By the year 2000, that number skyrocketed to more than 2,300. The numbers fluctuated through to 2013 when the state recorded another jump, this time to 2,750. Division of Substance Abuse and Mental Health Director Steve Detweiler says one driver behind the jump is more people have become addicted to legal painkillers. The number of people that are presenting for treatment that are addicted to legal opiates has skyrocketed over the last two decades, from a handful in the 80s to, to several thousand now that we see. But in recent years, as the state has cracked down on access to legal painkillers and doctors have changed prescribing practices, people moved to heroin, which is cheaper and offers that same euphoric high. When we saw that shift, we definitely saw an increase in, um, you know, how many clients we were, we're beginning to see. Mm -hmm. And the problem, I think, just grew at that point. Leslie Baker is the program manager at Brandywine Counseling and Community Services in Wilmington, an outpatient opioid addiction treatment center. Baker says at least 70 percent of her clients are heroin users. BCCS administers doses of medications like methadone to curb withdrawal symptoms and triggers for wanting to use. We have uh, over 1,000 clients and we t intake at least 24 a week and we always intake 24. So it's like there's plenty of you know, people that are suffering. Jennifer Whitehead, now 32, struggled with addiction for a decade and sought treatment from BCCS, but not before spending two years in prison. Yeah, to spend two years in prison for a missed probation appointment because I suffer from a disease, I think is pretty wrong um, because during the two years I spent there, I didn't get a lot of what you would think treatment should be. The science supports what we see as a chronic physiological response to pain medication and heroin. The public, I don't think, understands that completely yet. In addition to educating the public that addiction is a disease, Detweiler admits as a state, 
Delaware needs to do better. The state itself manages a number of different types of programs. We have outpatient, we have residential treatment, we have detox facilities. Given the demand and the, and the growth spike in it, though, there, there, right now there really are insufficient resources in the state. The state has to do a number of things. Number one, we have to increase this number of beds. Uh, number two, we have to work on the, um, the police and the courts and try to come up with a, with a system there that we're not incarcerating our problem and then we need a treatment. If this were the flu, you know, we mobilize resources for H1N1 and for, you know, other public health, you know, um, epidemics that come out. And so why aren't we doing the same for this? DHSS is set to unveil a public awareness campaign midsummer that includes a website that will serve as a clearinghouse for families and users to go to for help. Also, Newcastle County Council just approved half a million dollars in this year's budget for a heroin education program. And the key search for my story started up a support group called Attack Addiction that raises awareness about the dangers of opiates. So Shirley, where is the heroin coming from? Well, I spoke with Delaware State Police spokesman Sergeant Paul Shavick, and he said the majority of Delaware's heroin supply is coming from cities like Philadelphia and Baltimore, which are sourcing it directly from Afghanistan and Mexico. And how are law enforcement dealing with it? Well, Shavick said state police is implementing a two-pronged approach. You have to cut off the supply. You have to cut off the choke points of where it's coming into Delaware. Education, uh, rehabilitation, and treatment for that user uh, are a big uh, uh, push now. Uh, to, to help eliminate this problem. Now, my story, Don Keister, whose son Tyler unintentionally overdosed, said that the state can incarcerate its way out of the problem, and Shavik agrees with that 100%. But again, all goes back to resources and connecting police with those resources. All right, thanks, Shirley. And of course, this is a story that we will continue to closely monitor. You can follow our reporting on newsworks.org slash Delaware. Coming up on First, the practical lessons about money are presented in a different light at some Delaware schools. And old school printing is given a 21st century twist. We visit Lead Graffiti later in First Experience. Colin O'Mara is stepping down as Department of Natural Resources and Environmental Control Secretary on June 30th. He plans to spend his final week on the job marking the passage of the Coastal Zone Act. It changed the way development takes place in the state. Our video partner 302 Stories created a documentary on the law. Here's a portion of that film. It wasn't only Delawareans who enjoyed those pluses. A lot of people around from Maryland and Pennsylvania and New Jersey who would come over to Delaware to enjoy that wonderful ocean front and bay front. Along with support, the governor needed to draft legislation that accurately reflected his position. He had a very clear idea of what he wanted. And uh, I, of course, uh, followed his uh, instructions to the letter. This was not a Sandy Campbell bill, this was a Russ Peterson bill, through and through. Another interest group now joined forces with the major industries, the federal government. U.S. Secretary of Commerce, Maurice Stans, asked me to come to his office in Washington. When I arrived, he had 25 of his staff with him. <laughs> he said, these men have been working for 10 years to further the industrialization of the Delaware Coast. It is by far the best place in the East for such needed development. <clears throat> then he walked, he walked over to me and pointed his finger at me and said, Governor, you're being disloyal to your country. And I jumped up and said, hell no, I'm being loyal to future generations. Russ was not, I, I think it's fair to say in many ways, a reasonable man. To be reasonable meant to compromise. And there were all kinds of suggestions and amendments to weaken the uh, Coastal Zoning Act. I mean, people would argue, you know, this is a great idea, but really each case, each application really ought to be considered on its own merits. This case-by-case -case approach was endorsed in the final Marine Task Force report and was seized upon by the oil companies who actively courted Delaware legislators in a variety of ways. For example, taking legislators down to see some of their other plants and saying, see, it's not polluting anything. And these folks coming back and saying, yeah, that it looks that way and it's going to hire people. There was that kind of um, background of uh, hostility and that was sort of the form that it took. 
On the opposing side, groups like Delawareans for Orderly Development and Delaware Wild Lands were meeting with the governor, while also focusing their slowing tactics against Shell. We would buy a piece here, a piece there, and checkerboard it to try to protect a large single access to the water, which is critical for a refinery. Although the Nixon administration, State Chamber of Commerce, and all but one labor union opposed the bill, the local and regional press endorsed it, which kept the issue in front of the public, who pressured their representatives. And then the elected officials got the message. If they want to stay in office, they're going to have to support it. And, and we're all right there at the cutting edge. We'd have one time when there would be one or two votes majority against us, and then one or two votes for us. And it just kept moving back and forth from that, that cutting edge. But the governor's faith in the public was also backed by astute political savvy. Mr. President, I'd like to ask the floor leader of the bill, which has been denied to go in my committee, which is a procedure when Governor Peterson feels that certain people are not for the bill, and if he wants to ramrod something through without the people of the state of Delaware have an opportunity to discuss the bill. What's as important in the act as the environmental protection is that it doesn't completely prohibit industrial development. It just says it can't be heavy industry or it can't be bulk product transfer facilities, but you can certainly build manufacturing facilities. You can certainly have uses that are residential or tourist or other kinds of things. So it was trying to balance. But for other legislators, the decision was not so easy, and both chambers remained closely divided right up until the final vote. The House debate lasted almost seven hours, well into the evening. The clerical amendment prepared by the oil companies came up at 9.30 p.m. I was in the balcony watching the proceedings. It was an exciting, nerve-wracking moment. I held my breath as the votes were counted. We defeat the amendment by one vote, 20 nays and 19 nays. The final vote on the bill came at 10.45 p.m. Ms. Weiss? Yes. Mrs. Wright? Mrs. Wright? Mrs. Wright? Mr. Speaker? Yes. Mr. Speaker? Mr. Trivers? I change my vote from no to yes. Having lost the key vote on the oil company's amendment, <coughs> seven Democrats, including Sherman Tippett, switched their votes in order to be on record as having <laughs> favored a popular bill. <laughs> the following day, the drama repeated itself in the Senate with a one-vote margin killing the critical amendment followed by some vote changing and ultimately a sweeping victory for the final legislation. So it became the mother and apple pie route, but only at the very, very last minute because Peterson was on top of it and, and was um, having that kind of influence. On June 28, 1971, Governor Peterson signed Delaware's Coastal Zone Act into law. Our thanks to 302 Stories for sharing that piece. The Sierra Club will host a number of events to celebrate the Coastal Zone Act's 43rd anniversary during the weekend of June 27th through the 29th. We know that sometimes you want to watch first when it's convenient for you. That is why you can find it at whyy.org slash first. Past shows are there right now. This show is available on Monday. If you have Comcast, go on demand and watch us that way. It's been a month since we've seen Rob Torno. Time again to see what's inside his editorial cartoon brain. Hi, Rob. How you doing? Um, the first cartoon, which I think is hilarious, it's just sort of a nod to the 495 bridge closure. Right. Why don't you tell us a little bit about it? So I like playing with the flag as a visual, you know, taking those poor two guys and putting them in weird situations. So I thought, well, I can make a new Delaware flag at least through Labor Day when they're supposed to fix the 495 bridge and they're stuck in traffic, mm -hmm. you know, the poor guys. And it doesn't look like we're going to see this gas tax passed in Leg Hall, right. but would it even have made a difference with where we are with our infrastructure? I'm not sure. I mean, the CBO released a report showing how woefully underfunded 
our roads and bridges are over the last 10 years, and that problem is just going to continue to get worse over the next 10. It's a funding problem marked by efficiency cars and lack of gas taxes, and I don't know if there's not much we can do. I mean, we have to sort of be judicious about what we decide, and we have to figure out a better way to fund this needed infrastructure, as 495, you know, clearly shows. Del Dot, though, will have a lot of explaining to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, we still kind of don't know. We had a guy call ahead, you know, a month before the bridge was closed. We've got, like, dirt issues. You know, it's... It's one of those things that I don't think people still have their heads wrapped around about how this could happen. And you got stuck in some pretty bad traffic. I too. got stuck coming back from Philadelphia at midnight. Oh. You know, I had to take a detour on 95. It's it's pretty insane, you know, but what are you going to do? All right, we have some a few minutes left to talk about the uh, World Cup right, cartoon. Right, <laughs> World Cup. It's funny about soccer, you know. People in this country love golf, but uh -huh. they think soccer's boring, right? <laughs> But when they win, all of a sudden it's this rallying cry. So now U.S. won. We have another match this weekend. Mm -hmm. we'll see if they can keep it going. Yep, and I like the guy saying, goal. I can see it coming <laughs> out of his mouth, though. All right. Thank you so much, Rob. Read Rob's work at newsworks.org slash Delaware. Also, you can follow him on Twitter at Rob Torno. We'll be right back with more first right after this. 17 miles each way. Three round trips, it's gonna be a 12 hour day. Seven days a week. Extend your stay, take a trip across the bay. 365 days a year. Winds up to 45, 50 miles an hour. Yeah, brutal. For five decades. Thank you for taking a break from the ordinary. A WHYY original production. Billion Mile Journey, the Cape May Lewis Ferry. Wednesday, June 25th at 10 on WHYY. Since the 2007 financial crisis, there's been a growing interest in teaching students about personal finance, as well as how to deal with crushing student loan debt. In some Delaware classrooms, there's a program designed to keep students on the right track, providing them with the keys to financial success. So what that means is that your total debt shouldn't exceed 20%. Inside William Penn High School in Newcastle, students are learning what's required to make sound financial decisions and how to manage their own personal finances. There's research out there that shows kids start forming their habits about how they're going to spend their money, the choices they make about their money at a very early age. And once those ideas are embedded in their mind, it's really hard to change those misconceptions. The class is called Keys to Financial Success, a program that started in Delaware thanks to a partnership between the University of Delaware Center for Economic Education and Entrepreneurship and the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia. The course has many themes and topics surrounded by finance. In fact, it goes beyond money management, credit, savings, and investing. You have to be able to think about how you're going to handle your investments. And many of these students are going to have to be responsible for handling the retirement funds. So we need to start giving them that information before they leave school. According to Miserios, many students are not getting this type of information at home, forcing them to rely on experience. Personally, me personally, I'm very bad with like spending money on anything. Like if I see it, I want to get it. but. I'm getting better at it, I guess, so it's hard. it's hard. Although the information may be a tough pill to swallow for young people who love to go to the mall, students still find the class very helpful. Class is fun, also it's interesting. It's not, it's not a boring class. You're interested, I mean, it's, it's good for the long run. See, now I know how, if, how to invest my money. Teachers who are trained by the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia also find the course informative. The laws change so much in terms of finance with banking regulations and credit cards and what banks can and cannot do with people. So having a center and the Fed that constantly gives updates in classes, it really helps teachers stay on our toes and give the most updated info to the kids. In the end, students create a personal portfolio of tools and data that they're encouraged to keep as a reference when making financial decisions as adults. We found that the students actually grow in their understanding of personal finance about a 60% gain. And that's a huge increase in uh, personal finance knowledge. While that may be a huge accomplishment for the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia, that isn't enough. About one third of Delaware uh, high school students are getting the Keys to Financial Success course. We'd like to have more, but you can make a big difference in Delaware because it's a, a great small state to work with. So 
while the students in Delaware are getting some personal finance across the K-12 to grades, really before they leave and before they graduate and go out into college and the world of work, we want to capstone that experience with a semester personal finance course. Keys to Financial Success, which is composed of 52 personal finance lessons, was launched in 2001 at Newark High School in Delaware. Now, the billion-mile journey of the Cape May Lewis Ferry. The people who run the ferry have planned celebrations in Cape May next Saturday and in Lewis next Sunday to mark the 50th anniversary of the ferry. WHYY TV spent some time documenting ferry operations. Here's a clip. The thing that was probably pushed it faster than we would have expected was the bridge tunnel crossing in Virginia. What are they going to do with their ferries? And so somebody said, why don't you buy the ferries to Virginia? Sounds like a good idea, you know? The Cape May Lewis Ferry as we know it today came into existence in 1964 because of the opening of the Chesapeake Bay Bridge and Tunnel. It connected the southern tip of the Delmarva Peninsula to the rest of the Virginia coast. Before that time, it was connected by a ferry system. There's been ferry systems here since the colonial times. Uh, just up the bay a mile or so is Cherrystone. That was the main port for this part of the county uh, back in the 16, 1700s. Virginia's ferries were tied to the development of railroad service and a growing economy. In 1885 is when the railroad came to Cape Charles, uh, part of a north-south route. It was called the New York, Philadelphia, and uh, Norfolk Railroad back then. It ultimately became part of the Pennsylvania Railroad system. So there were steamers coming in, picking up railroad passengers and ferrying them the 30 or so miles across the bay to Norfolk. In 1918, 1919, and 1920, the three wealthiest counties in the United States were Los Angeles, California, Accomack County, Virginia, and Northampton County, Virginia. Because of the plethora of produce that was raised on Virginia's eastern shore that could be railed to the markets in the Northeast, it became a cash cow of agriculture. As the economy boomed, new ferries were added over time. The Pocahontas, the Princess Anne, the Delmarva, and the Virginia Beach. The ferries primarily moved people after World War II. But it was the construction of the bridge at Annapolis and the Delaware Memorial Bridge that turned the tide away from ferries. The governor realized that a fixed crossing would add to the abundance of the economics in regards to being able to get the markets connected from the northeast to the southeast. That's how they, uh, how the thing kind of moved from here up there. When the bridge tunnel was built, the ferries were no longer needed. And the ferries are for people that like ferries. There was a lot of pressure to build a, a bridge tunnel. When it, when it did open, uh, the ferries had no place to go except Delaware. <laughs> You can watch Billion Mile Journey, the Cape May Lewis Ferry, at 10 p.m. on Wednesday and again at 7.30 on Friday the 27th on WHYY-TV. Also Friday, Newsworks Tonight will be live in Lewis along the canal. Join host Dave Heller in person or listen on WHYY-FM 90.9 at 6 p.m. Catch us on the air in Lewis on 90.3. Details about the ferry's 50th anniversary celebrations next weekend can be found at capemaylewisferry.com. Using old world techniques mixed with modern graphic design, one new art company is using the printing press to create art. From posters and cards, books, stationery, and everything in between, Lead Graffiti is an eclectic mix of old and new worlds. It's our first experience this week. Lead Graffiti. We're a letterpress studio. It's a family-run business. My wife, Jill, my son, Trey, and I, we fell in love with that on a study abroad trip. I taught at the University of Delaware. We would take students over to London during the summers, and we came across letterpress. Thought it'd be an interesting thing for the students to have some historical experience. Got involved in it, fell in love, became quite frankly obsessed with doing it. Letterpress has been around for a long time, and the idea is that you've got a raised surface, 
that you put ink on it and then press that surface against the paper, uh, much like a rubber stamp would work. We have machines from the early 1900s to the late 1800s and so on. What Gutenberg did in 1450, we're doing the exact same thing. We're setting type in, we're inking the type, we're pressing the paper into it. No different than what they did 500 years ago. A lot of the papers are made uh, from cotton instead of wood fiber, so they feel more like cloth. So it has a tactile quality. It's meant to be held and touched and felt. We've done this project called Tour de Lettre Graffiti, where we watch the Tour de France each day, and each day we come back to the studio and translate the events of that day into a set of posters, one a day for 23 days. So the Library of Congress has them, UCLA has them, the British Library has them. Somebody can come in here three centuries from now and look at the 2014 Tour de France posters by Lead Graffiti. They're gonna be sitting in a box. It's incredible. It's cool, it's nice. Uh, it's great being able to say that you've got something in the Library of Congress or in special collections at the University of Delaware. It's cool, it gives you chill bumps. <laughs> Just kind of thinking about it. It's really a lot of fun. We want it to be preserved, and if we can show that uh, letterpress is more than just uh, wedding invitations and certificates, it's really expressing yourself through color, through typography. It's experimenting with that and expressing yourself creatively in that way. I like sitting in front of this machine and hitting the keys and just listening to the sounds of the machines working. There's pride in what you're printing, looking down at the type and actually seeing ink on the paper. And it's nice you know, knowing that this is something that we did, I did. There's that sense of, I made this. Oh, I have goosebumps right now when I'm thinking about this. That's your image, that's your print, you made that. There's nothing in between it. You didn't send it off, you didn't outsource it. You can just feel the human being in it just is complete fun to do. Traveling to London soon? Well, you can see an exhibit of Lead Graffiti's Tour de Lead Graffiti posters starting June 3rd at the British Museum. And if you're interested in learning the art of letterpress, Lead Graffiti holds classes throughout the year. Check them out at leadgraffiti.com. Next week on First, we'll sum up the show in two words, Firefly and Fairy. The Firefly Music Festival is underway in Dover. We'll show how it's become a musical force. And we'll present another peek at our program on the Cape May Lewis Ferry. Just another reminder to look for us in Lewis next Friday as Newsworks Tonight broadcasts live at 6 p.m. from the canal. That is first for this week. We thank you for watching. For Mark Eichmann and Michelle Polston, I'm Shirley Min. Have a great week. Wilmington residents can now sign up for free emergency text and email alerts directly from the Wilmington Police Department. The department can now issue alerts, which will simultaneously call landline phones, send text messages and email, and post to social media. The service is free for subscribers and registration is easy. Simply text your zip code to 888777 or register online at nixel.com where you can customize alert settings and choose to receive email and web alerts as well. With Nixel, you know.